Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, I am coming to you from Reno, Nevada, where it is snowing. My guest today, well, first of all, let me just say this. In my 25 years of the dance and music industry, usually a DJ uh, would claim that they have a good following, large following. And so you would always hire them to be, and, and only to be disappointed that no one really shows up because of them. <laughs> it's just, you know, some of them are probably five or 10 would show up because of their music and all that. Because not until the DJ organizes his own events, not just one event, but multiple events and be successful at it, that's when you know that the DJ has a good following. And, and uh, mind you, this young man I've known for a while since he probably started dancing since I started bachata festivals in the USA. But let me introduce to you DJ Migs, EKA Miguel Zaragoza. What's up, my brother? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. It's such a pleasure to be here. And yes, to um, speak to that comment, uh, I believe you have known me for my tenure in the dancing, starting as a dancer and watching that transition to a DJ. So it has been something. And I think. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, my first festival was actually San Francisco. Yeah. Um, so having that exposure and like attending one of the first ones, and I think one of the first ones that I attended was actually in downtown San Francisco, where you had uh, Dominic that Marte. Very, for... That was the very first one or the second one, I believe. If it was yeah. close to the uh, Union Square, that was the second one. Yes, it was the Union Square one. Yeah, because yeah. I distinctly remember there was... Uh, I think I left that night of the Dominic Marte performance after his oh, yeah. like, first yeah. set. And then I was just like, oh, this is this is something. This is very different. And especially as a young, impressionable college student, you're just kind of like, um, um, take a break. It's also a little pricey. <laughs> the college and, buzzer doesn't doesn't support that. <laughs> and mind you, Miguel, that was the time I lost eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> oh, man. oh my goodness man well hey props you're still here with this you're rocking and still hosting events and everything so we appreciate that yeah that's 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 one thing about you know where my legacy is is that there were failures but there were successes and one thing for sure is that i'm still kicking right there i haven't given up it's not it wasn't a one-time thing or one hit one wonder or something i kept it up i've been consistent and uh, rightfully so but Let's talk about you because first you were a dancer, uh, you mm -hmm. were teaching there for a minute and then you became a DJ. Now, I know you were going through school or college at that time. Was that your full-time thing? Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of people, and I, and I guess I can start here, um, where I started dancing. And a lot of people, when this question comes up, they're always very shocked and surprised by my answer. Yeah. I started dancing. My first dance classes was actually at a community college Latin ballroom class. Yeah. So my first dances were salsa, cha-cha-cha, tango, you know, traditional Latin ballroom stuff that they teach you. And then it wasn't until I think the following summer that they introduced bachata. And around that time, that's when a lot of the, the movement and everything was happening with um, the dance community really in at that point coming into the community college uh, setting and really, really just trying to pull in new dancers. Um, but for me, dance was only beginning to kind of emerge as something that I was, I was enjoying and really enveloping myself in. My full-time job, as, as you shared, Rodney, I was, I was a full-time student. You know, I was, yeah. uh, started at community college, transferred, did my undergrad at UC Davis, and then I, I kept it up as far as schooling and, and pursued my master's and completed that, you know, all while either dancing in the scene or transitioning and becoming a DJ and using that life as a DJ to support me while I was in graduate school. So it was quite something. <laughs> But, but it was something because it is one thing to be just a DJ uh, and do it a full-time job and not make that much money. But you were one of the lucky ones because you got talent and charisma to a point that you were able to support yourself being a student to do a side gig here and there when it comes to nighttime and all of that stuff. And uh, uh, one of the gig that you used to do was in the grad in UC Davis. Of course, it was very convenient. It's, it's very close to to where you're going yeah. to school yeah. but yeah. that's how i gotten to know you more because can you imagine us from the bay or san francisco would go there on thursday just to see you you know what i mean oh yeah yeah it it was uh 
something and to see and have so many people from across California, even Nevada yeah. as well, coming out to the graduate yeah. in, in Davis. And for folks who are watching and are not familiar, so the Davis graduate had existed for many, many years. Salsa night, um, I think up until that point prior to me, like beginning was I think around for about 16 years. And, and then when I started DJing there, that was about 2012. Yeah. And of Before course, you, it was DJ Nihat and then it was you. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, coming in, I, and I, I don't know how candid, you know, your past, uh, your past guests have been, but, you know, I walked into like the graduate as a student, again, a student of dance and everything like that. And, and I had this, like, I don't know, there was a hype that was built around me as a dancer from friends and people who had seen me like at different socials and small university club type things. Yeah. And, um, I, I loved bachata. I loved the music. I loved the messaging, the dance, just all the stuff that included it. And I think that that helped me to translate that so much into just the way I was able to communicate as a dancer. Yeah. Um, but one of the, the struggles, of course, with, with any dancer is, is finding a place in which you can hear the music that you love. Indeed. And of course, back in the day, um, and I think I've, I've, you know, seen a couple of your, your uh, interviews before in which, you know, talking about how Bachata was like first really beginning to uh, develop its popularity and with, yeah. you know, various artists, Aventura, um, Toby Love and countless others, it was hard to find a place that would play Bachata. And The Graduate was no exception to that. Like yes. Yes. DJ Nahad, I... A lot of love and respect for him. You know, he gave me my first shot as far as DJing at the graduate and, and really put me on as far as like creating that, um, that chance to, to really grow. But the music as far from a dancer's perspective, um, there wasn't too much diversity as far as the music that was being played. It's as far as just like more up-to-date music. So Nahad and I developed a friendship in which I would bring him CDs for those folks who are too young, yes, you can burn music on a CD, CD. Yes. and I would bring that to Nahad and I would update him with like all the latest bachata. I was like, yo, you got to play track, track yeah. seven. You know, this track is really hot. This is what all the kids are listening to. It's, it's so weird. Like at that time to, you know, again, I was a kid at the time. I was like 21, yeah. 22 and, and really just getting started. And, and eventually like that kind of enveloped and created this, this community within the graduate. And like I had shared, we had people from Fresno. Los Angeles, Nevada, the Bay Area, all these different places that would come out and party with us on a Tuesday. And then Tuesday became so popular that we expanded to Thursday. Thursday became so popular, we expanded to Saturday. So we were doing salsa night three days a week out there. Um, and I kept that up at least for myself because it was, it, you know, at some point I moved back to the Bay Area for my professional development with my, with my actual, <laughs> what like, I studied in school to do. professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are like, you're, you're not a full-time DJ? This is not what you do all the time? <laughs> like, no, no, it's it's kind of an awkward conversation with my parents where it's just like, well, you have a master's degree and you're still DJing. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah you know, it, it, I'm doing it. it. <laughs> it's called passion. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, I mean, you know, look, passion doesn't always pay the bills so you know you just gotta <laughs> no kidding right yeah, uh, yeah. But, but, but let's touch on your academic uh thing uh background um sure. congratulations by the way i knew you graduated many years ago i know this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. but the reason i applaud you for that is because in in the professional scene in the in our dance industry that is almost unlikely because we don't get to finish school because we are concentrated in our dance or music or DJ career because I mean how do you beat a one gig uh, uh, payoff versus two weeks payday you know you know one payday oh, yeah. on on your DJ gig beats any job <laughs> you know so so you get spoiled for that and and therefore you don't think about the future during that time but you're yeah. one of the few who, who thought about that how do you, what's your What's your journey about this? How hard was it? And were you really focused on really getting that master's? Yeah, so I think from the get-go, when I graduated from Davis, I, I didn't have too much direction with relation to what I was going to do in the future. Like yeah. in the sense of, I was still trying to figure it out. I was applying a master's program. So my, my master's degree, for, for folks that don't know, I have a master's degree in counseling. Uh, I currently work in education. I, I work as an academic advisor and counselor for students at the community colleges. And 
that has always been something that's been ingrained in me. Like my first love, my first passion um, is actually in education. I love, you know, having been a first generation college student, uh, going through those experiences, trying to, you know, make my parents proud as far as like my endeavors and what I've done. Um, And of course, just like coupling that with this love and this passion and this this aspect of my life that was just growing, which was dance, of course, yeah. and finding the balance. And, and I think I always just had it on my mind. Like my education came first, like dance was always going to be something that would exist and be there uh, and be a part of my life. But there were definitely times in which I can honestly say uh, dance did overtake part of my life <laughs> in my studies, you know, like it, it's not, it's not a good look. Nope. When, when you have practicum or a class in the morning and you did a gig the night before to like three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And I would come to class like dead tired. And yeah. my instructors, like a lot of them, they eventually found out they're like, well, clearly he studies at night. And, but I wasn't, I was a night owl at the time, you know? So I would, I would do a gig, go home. I would crank out a, a paper or do uh, contribute to a research product that I was doing. And and it was, it was such a life. Like I lived a Batman lifestyle in which, you know, I was, I was somewhat awake. I was like the professional Bruce Wayne here, like talking all this theory and whatnot. And then at night I was just like, well, let's party. And yeah. it was. <laughs> you guys are lucky in this generation because when I had your life, when I was young, there were no technologies. There was no Google who will help me write a paper and research. Dude, I would, I would be going like what, six times a night for dancing the only reason it was six times is because Monday there were no salsa or bachata during that time in the Bay. And so yeah. six times a night, and you would wake up and sometimes the same clothes that I wore in the club is the same clothes I go to, oh, yeah. go to school. Oh my goodness. And then you would be late in your paper and you'd be crunching and you go to the library. You remember, I don't know if you remember because you're this young. I'm too old for you. All right. <laughs> library, you don't research the book by going to the computer no oh, no 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 you there have a certain cut- <laughs> yeah no oh hey you know uh, yes technology has done wonders but sometimes you had to go in find that book work with the librarian yeah. and, and just like pull it up and but not to- just that you remember microfish <laughs> okay okay that's what you- sorry ronnie you might have dated yourself right there but sorry yeah, really, really- <laughs> <laughs> but anyway I do upload, how's your, you have a, a, a good job right now uh, uh, based on your master's degree. How's that going? Uh, work is great. Work is yeah. great. I think one of the things that, and I'm sure many have kind of seen it, or if you have kids of your own or yeah. you're going through school, you're, you're fully aware of just this transition to uh, online learning. It's, it's been a really big struggle. Of course, one of the biggest challenges that we've noticed within the community college space is that a lot of kids just don't have access to the infrastructure of, of internet yeah. technology with laptops and things like that. Or if they do, they're limited as far as just being able to be attentive to class. I mean, yeah. I had meetings with students in which, you know, parents would be yelling at them, telling them to like, hey, go, go take care of your siblings, do chores. Yeah. And we they're like, hey, mom, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in this meeting right now. Like, I, I can't step away from it. So yeah. being understanding and, and completely like, present and knowing where students are at at that point, I think has been a really uh, great, great thing for me because I feel like I'm supporting them through their academic journey, just as my advisors in the past have done for me. So I love the work that I do. It's very enriching. um, And it just gives me the opportunity to bestow the knowledge and hopefully help the students to not make the same mistakes that I did when I was a student. And, um, and also like introduce them to new things that they may not have been open to. I've I've had a number of students who I've worked with, um, where they'll ask me like, what do you, what do you do? Like when you get to college or what are some hobbies or some things that you picked up on? And surprisingly enough, when I tell them like, oh, you know, I, I kind of, I did some dance and and they're like, you dance and for, for folks, it's, it's a, it's a mixed bag, right? You tell them you dance and it's just like for my parents, they think. Dancing with the Stars or, or uh, yeah. Bailando por un Sueño, like what they watch in Spanish or whatever. And then for other kids, they think like you're, you're hip hop, you're a Jabberwocky <laughs> or, or whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, but letting them know, it's just, it was a great place to find community, to find like-minded individuals in which you're just wanting to create uh, a chance to build and a new identity for yourself. I think mm-hmm. that's definitely one of the big things that dance did for me was what it helped to create an identity that I never saw in myself. 
Yep. And, and it translated into really impacting and influencing others to be comfortable with themselves, but also picking up a new skill. And I know the pandemic has made things harder for folks to kind of get out there and dance, but at the same time, it's like, you know, there's still the music, there's still like practicing or dancing in your kitchen and stuff. That's something I find myself doing quite a bit of. How do you, um, how do you analyze a person who comes to your office and you look at his grades or you look at his high school diploma or high school, what do you call that thing with grades and all of that subject? Uh, transcript, transcript, yeah. <laughs> I have forgotten. But <laughs> so transcript or whether, uh, 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 whatever they came from, or from another country, whatever. Um, well, first of all, let me ask you this question. On the average, what's the most usual subject that you would recommend to a person? Ooh, um, you know, the, the conversation, and, and it's interesting because community college is such a mixed bag. You know, yeah. if I was doing advising at the university, of course, your students are coming in with a lot of different questions. Sure. I think for a lot of folks who are in community college, it's, they're more familiar with like the big uh, uh, prestigious positions that are, exist out there, lawyer, doctor, right. engineer, um, all these, these things that their families are, are very familiar with that they'll recommend to them. And I, I just, I work with that student and really just talk to them about like what their interests are, but also letting them know there is more than one path to reach the final goal. Sure. And it's, it's understanding and knowing like you don't need to study, um, you know, biology to become a doctor in the future. Sure. You can go into all these other fields. And, and I think it just really depends with some of those conversations and really just gauging and seeing where they're at with relation to what they want to do in the future. I realize like my name still says my actual name. So I'm going to change that to my... You basically connect with them because that's very hard to connect with a person that's stranger, you know? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Developing that rapport uh, with somebody in in the short time that we have. I'm fortunate enough, I I work in a specialized program in which I get to see my students multiple times. So I get to know their story. I I know them like we pick up and half the time when I'm doing evaluations, like other counselors are coming in. They're like, I, I have no idea what you guys have been talking about. I was like, yeah. I've met with this person like, you know, five, six times prior to this meeting. So we just pick up where we go. You just have to you, you, catch you it at this point. Me, you do remind me of my counselor because you got to realize I graduated high school in the Philippines. Oh, I, I went to that. schooling in the Philippines uh, when I was 12. I was sent there. And so I graduated high school there. So getting into college in the United States was a bit tough. So you had to go to a community college first. You know, to, to get to the university. And I had a counselor who I met a few times. He actually was one of the one who introduced me to Arnis, which is a Filipino martial arts. Oh, yeah. So they would go yeah. to Fort Mason and practice there every Wednesday, man. So nice. what he was after my class, he would pick me up. He would bring me there. And my first instructor was a, a man called Rene Latusa, which is Latusa okay. Prima. And yeah, yeah. I think he's now in L.A., but I think he still exists. <laughs> he's still alive. <laughs> Most of my instructors were like dead now because I'm 55 years old, man. So, but you remind me there because he really guided me and I was very weak in math, dude. <laughs> I hated that subject. I still hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what you. do you do with those students that hate math? And you would see their grades, their face. <laughs> you know, ed- education has come a long way. Um, I can honestly say like there's been more intention about being more mindful of students and where they're coming from with their their math back with with any subject background and a lot of times um, the conversations in education are really centered around this idea of um, instructors serving as gatekeepers yeah and for folks who aren't familiar gatekeeper essentially in educational terms is like that person who's essentially like if you can't pass this class you don't deserve to go on to that higher level. You don't deserve to pursue X position that you're looking at. Yeah. And that mentality, it's, it's very, um, I, I like to say it's very archaic, archaic yeah. because everyone is capable of a- achieving the goals and the dreams that they have. They just need to be connected and utilize the resources that are available to them. And half the time for a lot of students, they're just very shy. They just don't want to. The idea of asking for help is very intimidating. I can yeah. honestly say for myself, I didn't do it during my my college undergrad and and very little in my my graduate program and shoot even for my uh (laughs) dance experience i didn't ask for too much help either but i I think it's one of those pieces in which it's a level of maturity that you reach in which 
um, you humble yourself to be able to ask for that help and knowing that those individuals who are assisting you are uh, helping you to reach that next level. And especially for those students with like who struggle in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, really, really working with them, being intentional about meeting with them and really helping to dispel any of those like thoughts of like, hey, I can't do it. And I, no one in my family has done it. And, and clearly, you know, myself and many of my uh, colleagues were first gen. So we understand the experience that students are going through. Granted, technology is has changed quite a bit. So, you know, there's my, I'm learning things all the time. I, I, I'm always shocked. And, you know, you shared about like, oh, I didn't have Google when I was a student and looking well, for microfish, things. Microfish, man. <laughs> yeah, microfish and stuff. And now I'm sitting here and I'm like, dang, I wish we had some of these programs when I was a student. This would have made <laughs> cranking out that paper a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now let's talk about the dance industry. Um, yeah. You know, it's very rare. Like I told you in my intro about you, uh, and I've seen you grow up as a dancer, as a DJ, as a pro yeah. in the dance scene. Now, it's very hard. I think you're the only one. I can't think of anyone in the history of the Sacramento uh, Davis area when it comes to transitioning to the Bay Area. And when you transition to the Bay Area, you still had that same following, if not more. Uh, you know, most of the time, DJs from that area in Sacramento area and, and D Davis they're successful in that area only, meaning their, uh, their pool is only that area. When they do events here in the Bay Area, there's not much because they're not known. But you are also known in the Bay Area. Not to mention, you know, I, I have to say, I, I was with you in, in France when you DJed there. You're, you're, you, have, you made a name for yourself there and other spots in, in the USA or even the world for that matter because yeah. I think you went to Asia also. But anyways... What's the secret? Why is it that people follow you? You have uh, a certain following and they're all young. <laughs> um, th thank you so much for, you know, pointing that out. I, I sometimes when I reflect and after, you know, being a little dormant with relation to the scene this past, you know, a uh, year and a half to the pandemic, it's, it's always a, a trip for me to kind of reflect and think about just that, that following and that, um, trust that truly people have with, yes. with the work that I do. Um, I would say the, the secret is just being attentive and just being like, know your audience and know what exactly you bring to the table. Yeah. Um, you know, when I started DJing, um, I think just like many other folks, when you start doing anything, you're, you're, you're learning, you're learning. I, I, I have this story on my social media pages and I, and I shared, I was like, I was horrible. You know, people were, were ready to burn me at the state. They're like, who, who, who is this person playing two bachatas in a row at the graduate? You and, know, and like he this... plays Dominican bachata with Prince Royce. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. Like, so it's, it's such, to me, it was such a trip to really, yeah. you know, grow and develop that identity for myself because I, you think about DJs nowadays and, and this is no, you know, I preface this as no disrespect to anybody, but this is honestly what ends up happening for some DJs is that yeah. you become known as that DJ. Yeah. And you become known as the sensual DJ. You become yeah. known as the modern, moderna DJ. You become yeah. known as the traditional DJ. And for me, I looked at the genre of bachata and you looking are at the subgenres. DJ, not a specific one. Yeah. And it's just like, I, and, and even then, I'll, Take it a step back. To me, yeah. I, I just look at it and I'm like, I'm a DJ. Yeah. You know, I would go and do events and across various areas. You know, I, I did Sacramento Davis. That's where I got my first start. I would drive from the Sacramento Davis area out to the Bay weekly, almost like yeah. a religious pillage for me it's true. To, to just go to events, Cafe Kokomo, uh, Glass Cat, you know, even though I was underage, you know, we ain't going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that. <laughs> I'm also guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and countless others. And honestly, it was through promoters like yourself, um, Corey Rayner, uh, and, and countless others through the Bay Area in which I was able to develop an identity. Who They gave me this. Actually, um, one person I do want to give a big shout out to who really, really gave me the chance to kind of shine and develop an identity, especially in San Francisco, is DJ Hong. Um, I'll never forget it. I DJed one of the um, uh, the SF Mambo socials that they end up doing that Hong would collaborate with all these other DJs. And 
I would come in and you had that hardcore on two crowd. Freaking hardcore, yeah. Hardcore. And like to me, I play good music. I like to think I play good music. <laughs> and whether or not that translates and relates to everyone else, like, you know, for those folks who are watching and are considering starting to DJ, here's a, here's a, a good rule to remember. When you're playing for a hardcore on two crowd, stay away from Mark Anthony. Stay away from Mark Anthony and even even Victor Manuel for that. Yes. For that yes. Lot, yes. Yeah. Yes. All and, Salvadura, dude. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it was actually at that venue. Yeah, I played the Mark Anthony track, and uh, you know a lot of people came up, and Hong was that barrier with the crowd and saying like, you know, there's still a lot of people dancing, enjoying. Like mm -hmm. to me, the music that I play takes me back to growing up. Like yeah. you know, being Latino it wasn't uncommon that we'd be at family parties and you would hear your Mark Anthony, Elvis Crespo, oh, really? uh, you know, Los Hermanos Rosarios, all, all those cats that would play. And, you know, for my family, Bachata wasn't too big yeah. in, in, in those days. But to be able to bring that to the community and then just for people to know, like, this guy, he's, he's about having a good time. He's about creating a fun environment. And I think that was the big piece that I always wanted to carry with me is, like, my goal is that when you came to a social I was DJing or promoting is that you would have a good time. Now, people are busy, <laughs> so you don't always get the crowd following that you want. And, and I, I'm sure that's uh, for folks who are, are wondering how, how you keep that crowd. It's, it's just consistency. It's dedication. I was on that grind from a DJ to promoter um, for a number of years. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were some good years in which, you know, financially I could say, yeah, I, I, I did all right. I did all right. And then there were some years in which I'm like, okay, you know, I, I, I need to tighten up and bring back the ramen. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it's one of those pieces where I, I really reflect and I'm just like, it, it was, it was life-changing, uh, to have those opportunities and to, again, to develop that following. Cause I, I look back and I still appreciate it. There's still people I run into and, and they just appreciate the memories that were created. You know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to see, a lot of beautiful things happen within the dance community, people meeting their partners. I met my partner, my, my wife in the, in the dance community. And, um, and to be able to know that, you know, having the ability to be a part of those memories, um, is something really special to me. So I think it's just, um, you know, knowing who you're uh, performing for and performing can, you know, encompass a lot of different things, whether it's the dance performance, social dancing, um, DJing, promoting, all that stuff uh and, and and the audience that you're you're presenting that to so how's your wife by the way Cause to those of you who doesn't know ladies and gents i'm sorry he's married now uh <laughs> <laughs> I, like i said i've seen this guy grow up so yes. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but i congrats you've been you. married maybe a couple of years now three years maybe two yeah, years yeah yeah Spot on. and yeah. Uh, uh i've always thought that your wife felicia is a filipina but no, but that's okay. Oh, good. <laughs> but how are you guys doing? We are doing well. We're doing well. I, I think this this pandemic period has brought us closer. Um, and I'm sure as, as many folks have had the opportunity, you get to know your partner on a much different level, especially when you're spending, you know, 24 hours of a day with them. You yeah. learn, they, they also learn about you. But I, I'm very thankful that, you know, we have grown closer during this time. And we have just... Um, you know, develop further developed our relationship. I, I think I, I love it. I, this pandemic period I know has been very difficult for many people. A lot of people have experienced loss or just challenges with relation employment and a lot of different things. And, and um, it, it, you know, it's impacted me too. Um, but with relation to looking within my own personal bubble, um, I, I'm fortunate enough to say that I'm, I'm, I have developed a really stronger connection and bond with my wife. And I'm extremely thankful for it. We expanded our family and I know people are going to jump in. I'm like, Oh, you had a kid. I'm like, ah, I have a fur baby. I have a little puppy. His name is Pablo. He turns one on Monday. So. Oh you know, man. It's... Talk about dog wifey Isidra. Uh, I think she has a friend that, uh, that had, that just had children, many dogs. And you know, she was looking for people to adopt one of them and Isidra uh, uh, decided it's like oh okay let me have one and then of course Isidra we've already talked about it like no I don't want a dog because I'm not ready to commit you know uh, you know how high maintenance they are and I was like no I don't want to have because 
I don't like small dogs. I don't know about you, but I like big dogs. My wife likes small dogs. So we're, you know, uh, pretty much like opposite in that part. But <laughs> last week, we almost got a dog. And, you know, as a husband who has known my wife for a long time, and we really truly connect, uh, when she makes a decision, she really does think about it. Me, I'm an impulsive type of guy. She is more logical. Uh, and I'm very surprised that she decided right there and then. I was like, well, I want you to think about it for a couple of days. And she's been bugging me. You know, get the dog, get the dog. She would give me that poppy look. It's hard to say no to this poppy look, by the way, when wifey do, do that. But I let her, and I think her, and then in the last minute she said, okay, yeah, we shouldn't have a dog. <laughs> The high maintenance were not always in the house. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> you know, and the training and all of that stuff. But, but that's one of the things. But one of these days we'll have a pet, whether it's a cat or a dog. We're both cat and a dog anyway. But you guys got a dog already? Yeah, yeah. So we've, uh, again, we've had our pup. Uh, he's turning one uh, fairly soon. Um, we've had him since February. It's, it's been a journey. A lot of my uh, co-workers uh, joke with me I was I'm the office I'm in is actually right next to the front door so my, I think okay. my wife has just stepped out um, but you know the the conversations around having a dog I think you know I grew up with dogs it's it's been such a blessing to have this little guy and to train them and work with them and and really really have that um, connection with something that loves you unconditionally and it's, yeah, it's not to say like um it's been an easy journey because lord yeah. knows I, you know he gets into stuff he eats things that he's not supposed to he <laughs> currently has uh some stomach issues right now so i'm being very mindful and intentional i've had a lot of bath time with him you know <laughs> cleaning him and stuff so um but you know beyond that i think it's it's been a wonderful experience having a dog and and as many of my coworkers joke with me they're like it's, it's great preparation for children so you know it's it's uh whenever that time happens for us you know we're, we're getting a head start on that <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. Um, I know you uh, are MIA for a while in the dance scene, okay, because of the pandemic and probably other things. Um, so as you look at the DJs in their industry now, not just in the Bay Area, but everywhere, what is now missing? And, and how, what's the, what are we looking at future-wise uh, that, that would enhance certain practices about DJs because it's always good when you're outside the box now because you could now look and it's like oh here's what's missing you know yeah um I, I think oh that's a that's a deep question um you know full transparency I, I have not gone out to many socials sure. I've maybe attended you know less than a handful and you know what I've seen is is each promoter each DJ is doing their own thing yeah and I think there's an aspect and an element where people will look towards someone else, a I famous see. DJ, I and see. wanting to emulate and recreate that rather than necessarily looking and cultivating and developing their identity. Because yeah. it's one thing to go and play a particular DJ's you know, personal productions, the remixes, yeah. things like that. <clears throat> um, and then it's another thing to you know, find the time to, to really pay attention to what your audience is looking for. I, a lot of people really, really also from the, from the public perspective, it's just like, there's, there's an aspect, I, I can't explain it. Like definitely, I, I, I totally understand. Yeah. I totally understand what you mean. Like there's, a, there's something that's missing. Um, and, and it's one of those pieces. And I think it was lost when the pandemic happened. And I think slowly but surely people are trying to find what that was and, and cultivate it and bring it back. But it, it's taking time, you know, things are just more complicated this time around. And you hear of these conversations and people are like, well, yeah. if I go out, like what are the possibilities of me, you know, getting yeah. sick or getting someone else sick kind of thing. Um, but I, I think identity, like definitely like the identity of a DJ is something. And again, I haven't, been out so much but I, I feel like that's definitely one of the things because there's a certain point you go out and if you were to hear a dj and and, and lineup of djs there's a certain point in which you know what are people playing 
is yeah. it's may sound like it's a lot of the same stuff mm. because there's the go-to tracks um and and people are just kind of like i get it you're playing to your audience and stuff but also understanding as a dj you have a very very important role and a lot of people think that like your job is to play music and cater to the crowd but your job in addition to that is to introduce your audience to new music yeah there's so much amazing amazing music out there from countless homegrown artists that you don't need to drop the latest drake bachata remix or you know these those artists have their their mainstream audience following and don't get me wrong the remixes are wonderful because it helps to bridge us to popular uh mainstream audiences and and brings in those new dancers like oh i really like this track it's you know bad bunny and will smith and mark anthony they got this really good vibe going and and whatnot and people really gravitate to it and, the, and they want to get into it but then that's when the dj's job is like okay i'm gonna play this new track by Kill One Cosmos or JR or some yeah. of the more modern artists. Um, and then also let me take you back and introduce you to the roots, the culture of bachata, playing, you know, Anthony Santos, Luis Vargas, Fernando Rodriguez, countless others that all, you know, and are the essence of bachata. Yeah. And I think as a DJ, like if you aren't doing that, it's, it's one of those things that I, I highly recommend that you reconsider to look to incorporate with your music because a lot of times, again, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great remixes, there's a lot of great music out there that, that a lot of people love to popularize, but at the same time, take a second and look back. That music from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, that's some good stuff. There's some gems in there in which if, if you bring it to the audience, they're just like, oh, I love this, this new track. And it's just like, well, it's not that new. It's, 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 it's actually like a little dated yeah. uh, or it's, it's, it's the origins of, of this dance. And, and a lot of times people just like, they forget that this dance isn't just like, you know, 2010 yeah. to present, it's it's actually extended a much more extensive history since like what, the 60s, the 50s, yeah. 70s, something like that. Well, despite all the technologies that we have now, Spotify, all the things that you can access to music to, you can have 3,000, 4,000 collections of music. But if, as a DJ, if you don't have the skill, now I'm not saying you have Pioneer, you have freaking all kinds of app there. That doesn't help. That doesn't yeah. help, but what helps is Feeling the audience is a skill. Uh, it's not acquired in my opinion. It's either you're a feeler or not. Because if you're not a feeler as a DJ, there is a reason why people follow you. There is a reason why the crowd follows the DJ. And it's not because um, he has a popular name. There's a reason why he's a good DJ. Number one, number two, you connect. And when you connect, you have that following. And you're not just there just to play. Let's say most DJs that I know that are really good, they don't plan the music they play. They already <laughs> have that collection. And as they go to, let's just say for analogy, a fight, they actually do their own music or they do, they do their own technique during fighting because that's the only way they could figure out yeah. the person in front of them. It's the same thing with the DJ right there and then in the club in the floor they are able to feel the audience like okay i'm gonna play this next because of this and i think that's one of the thing missing in our industry and and we could blame that into technology because it's accessible and that everyone thinks they can be a dj does that make sense yeah yeah and you know when you bring up that aspect of like not having a, a set pre-planned yeah, I, I agree with that. I think one of the pieces is like, you don't know your audience who it's going to be for that night as much as you prepare because you can have a range of people joining you for the evening. Yeah. I mean, having worked at a Congress, you know who's coming. Oh, yeah. You know who your audience is. Yeah. But when you do a bar or a nightclub, you yeah. have no idea who your audience is. Like yeah. having been on the other side as a promoter and um, I'll share with you a story. I'll never forget it. I was I was uh, promoting and doing the work, uh, managing the Hot Pachata Nights event out in San Francisco at uh, Love SF, as it's currently known as. And, you know, I would bring in DJs. Like, I understand the art, the craft of DJing. My older brother, who who had been DJing at the time when I started for like, you know, 16 some some odd years yeah and he had shared with me you know you gotta you gotta read your crowd you gotta understand like if you play a song you clear the dance floor that's it your party's like you gotta do a lot of work to kind of salvage and save them 
And when you play for like a nightclub audience, again, you don't know who's coming in. And there were times where I'd bring in DJs and I'd say, hey man, do your thing, play what you want, but understand people will let you know they don't like you. Oh yeah. And, and there were nights where we would have our, our hot bitch up the night social and, and people would come up, they'd find me. They knew who, the, they knew who I was because oh, they're yeah. like, hey, you, you brought this guy? And I was just like, yeah, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. He was like, this guy's horrible. And yep. I said, I, I like him. He, you know, he's doing a good thing. He was like, what the hell was that? And, and, and a lot of times it was folks who were not dancers, like people who just loved and appreciated the bachata music, like yeah. the, the traditional stuff, the stuff that yeah. they grew up with culturally. And they were just like, you know, the track by, uh, what, is, what is one of the ones that, um, I don't know, one of those, one track that people just really is just like, why, why is this even being played right now? This is horrible. You know, this is not bachata. This is just a, <laughs> this is a pop song with a, with a bongo beat on it kind Don't of thing. Bachata, as they call yeah, it. yeah. And, and, and again, there's, there's tracks within that space that are, that are great. Like, I love it. I can definitely get down to it. But then for, there's other people in the audience that you're, you're not going to please everybody. Yeah. You're not going to please any, anybody, everybody. And I think that's a piece in which you just have to keep in mind in the back of your mind as a DJ and also as a promoter too, because you're going to have people that are angry. Like it, it, it hurts, man, when you get them Yelp reviews and people just like roasting you and saying like, you're, you're a horrible person and you can't host an event and things like that. And, and you understand you develop at a certain point, thick layer of skin and you just kind of like brush it off and like, Hey, you know, this one person who was upset, you know, I can't do much to change their experience from the past, but you can work on improving things and taking those comments and suggestions and hopefully adapting, but also understand you don't have to change everything. You know, you can't please everybody. Yeah. But when you got a group of angry, um, and they let me know, yeah. <laughs> angry Dominicans who are angry at your DJ, I'm about to throw a bottle at your DJ, man. He's horrible. <laughs> That's just, when you. It's just a matter of getting to know the audience because some of them, and I don't say this as an insult to put them down. Some of them are uneducated when it comes to whether it's salsa or bachata, when it comes to the music. And when they say, oh, you play a lot of Dominicans, what they were really saying is that you play a lot of fast songs, not necessarily Dominicans. You know, yes. does that make sense? Yes, 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 yes. And when you are able to figure that out, that's what I said. That's what I say, skill, you know, when yeah. you feel the, 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 when you feel the audience, that's a skill in itself. And, and, and when you try to figure that out, when you could figure that out, I think that uh, the audience would love you just like they love you. <clears throat> now, as a promoter, let me, let, me, let me say this because you could relate to this a little bit. But as a promoter of Congresses, uh, y y yeah, you, you do get those complaints early in the morning, emailing you or texting you, you know, bringing that DJ. And it's kind of, it, it, it's kind of hard for a promoter not to invite that person next year again because of that, because it's hard to tell that DJ that people don't like him, you know? <laughs> it's very hard to tell oh that DJ. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and then you look like the bad guy. But the other thing that I need to say about DJ is that very few DJ can say, look, if you feature me at your festivals, I'll bring crowd. This is if you don't know the promoter, right? You're yeah. just introducing yourself to the promoter. I know, I know you as a promoter, I'm uh, me as a promoter for a long time. I've seen many DJs approach me personally, whether it's email or Facebook, whatever, promising things that doesn't happen. DJs, if, whether you're a rookie, especially if you're a rookie, don't do that to promoters. Because if you do that, you will never get hired again. When you say you're going to bring this type of people, make sure you really have that ability because sometimes in social media, you think you're very popular. You're not until that yeah. thing happens. This is why when in my intro with Migs here, uh, it's very hard for a promoter to have their own gig because that's when re they really know they have a following as a DJ. And like Migs said, we're saying it's all about connection. It's very amazing that Migs followers from the Sacramento, Sacramento to Davis area followed him to the Bay when he used to do an East Bay uh, uh, gig with Kathy Reyes and when he used to do a gig in the San Francisco Broadway area, it's called Bachata Nights of course, uh, not only that, that he was able to connect with the Bay Area community to support him as well. Now that's a big feat, uh, that's a big type of uh, uh, 
thing that you could pull out, bro. I mean, it's rare to do it, don't you think? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, if being the person who did it, I, I don't really, again, I don't think about it as much because it was just part of the networking aspect of connecting yeah. with various dance instructors, promoters, and just yeah. putting my name out there. And, you know, sometimes you might have to do a freebie to kind of prove yourself <laughs> kind of thing to folks. Um, in the beginning, of course. Yeah. 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 And then at a certain point, you know, you, you understand your worth, you understand what you bring to the table, what you can do for that promoter. And, and um, knowing that your audience, that if they follow you, if they come to this event to support you, they know what they're getting. They know when you jump on stage, when you perform or play as a DJ, uh, it's, it is a performance, yeah. but they, they are gonna get a level of entertainment that they were looking out to get, whether that was hanging out with their friends to just enjoy like a good vibe and good conversations yeah. or really enjoying an intense dance. That was the piece I was always looking out for because, yeah. you know, coming from the social dancer, becoming the DJ, I, it, it had a, I had a new insight. And then from that aspect to then transitioning from DJ to promoter, that was another layer that I was able to kind of add and contribute to my worth that I was carrying with me and presenting to the, the audiences, whether that, again, as you shared, Sacramento Davis to the Bay Area and, and, and beyond. And I think the, the coolest thing was having that develop and my name carry weight, like in different places, man. Like I, my name was, I don't know how it happened. And, you know, it's not very often that I get to talk about this because I'm, I'm a very like quiet and uh i definitely i feel like i've become more humble so <laughs> you know if people are listening to this i'm like oh, this guy's like tuning his own horn quite a bit want to be humble how about that <laughs> <laughs> um but you know pe people if they love you they love the work that you do and you're going to be rewarded for it you know i was very fortunate enough that my name and the performances the work that i did with kathy and countless others you know it took me different places i as, as Rodney shared, I've played in uh, various countries, I think seven to date, France, Luxembourg, Germany, uh, Spain, Singapore, yeah. Philippines, yeah. Um, and a couple other places. But again, that name that people understood when I, when I was coming, and for those who didn't know me, who didn't know me, <laughs> but it was my friends who did a lot of the work. I'm like, yo, you got to come out and support this person. He's going yeah. to do the thing. Um, but it was such a really cool experience to know that there was that level of support and, and an audience that was just growing and learning to love and appreciate you because you were bringing in yourself. I felt like I was bringing my most authentic self to the events or the authentic DJ self. I'm, again, I'm very private. I'm an introvert uh, by, by nature. Like, I know people are listening and saying, he's an introvert. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm an introvert, man. <laughs> no, you're in, you're in, the, you're in, you're at the border. You, you're, you're both you're both alpha and beta <laughs> like slight yeah yeah it, it, uh, it, you're a cancer right mm -hmm. yeah that's the reason <laughs> I, I know you are too man I, I'm, I'm a cancer leo so i'm marked more on the alpha thing but sometimes i have the beta man i and 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 to be honest it's great to be beta because you can observe and you can learn a lot of things from observing Amen. and that's what i do in the industry i observe and therefore i'll, I'll i am able to figure out which the person has talent and which the person has a pool. Uh, by the way, I can attest to this, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to Migs having a pool, because as a promoter, and my wife always tells me there this about Migs, as a promoter, I am much more nicer to you guys than my wife. My wife, we can't say she's not nice, but we could say she's very, uh, she's very businesslike, you know, it's like, okay, Migs, you're going to come to that or you're going to DJ? How many people are you going to bring? <laughs> She's going to ask you that. And, and yeah, yeah, she, she always is. tells me that Migs never fails. Never fails. Always, if he said he's going to bring this type of audience, he's going to bring this type of audience. That's why my wife always hire him. And, 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 and from, for me, from, as an observant from Sacramento, Davis, to Berkeley, to San Francisco area, I know Migs has a pool. And I know that it's his name. He would say it's his name. Uh, it is true. I agree with that. But it's much more when I observe him. Whenever he puts out a video right there, hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is where I'm going, blah, blah, blah. You can see how many people like, how many people he's engaging. Because that's charisma. Okay. 
And and that's not a gift, ladies. <laughs> you can't learn that from school. It's either you have it or you don't. And he says that he's a beta. He's an he's an introvert. Come on, you can't pull that up in a video, dude. <laughs> Out of practice, man. If you could see the amount of retakes that I had to do in some of those, and and yeah, there were some videos like people. I think they saw me like driving, and yeah, I had to do it in one take. You know, I'm on my way to the venue, everyone. Be sure to come out support us. I'm at X venue. I'm gonna be going on at this time. And, and it yeah. was one of those things in which, you know, you, you it came with a lot of practice, man. I've, I've What's been... the plan, brother? What's the plan? Are you coming back? Uh, are you going to, uh, I know you've been MIA. Are you uh, going to get with Kathy again after this pandemic or what up? Yeah. So for those folks who are wondering, um, of course, this pandemic has, you know, put a lot of things on pause and slowed down. Um, I, I do want to preface and say this. I had the opportunity to really reflect during this pandemic period and look at my life in terms of what I was doing. And a lot of my time was going to the dance scene. True. And I missed out on so many, you know, important, you know, family, friend events because I would have to leave early because I had to go and drive to a venue. I'm more conscious and mindful of my time these days. Good. Um, I'm more selective of the events and gigs mm -hmm. that I do. I feel like I've reached that seniority having been in the scene. But for, I noticed as a... that. I noticed <laughs> that for three years now, you've been selective and that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, and as a DJ, I'm coming up on 10 years of DJing, even though like the last year I didn't really do too much. Yeah. Like, per playing for myself, I guess, but not yeah. doing events and things and college stuff. But um, <laughs> I think one of the, the key things uh, is that I'm, again, I'm more selective with the events and things that I do and, and, you know, pandemic really changed me, man. Like Ronnie, you know, I was out there in these streets, man. I was out to like two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning, making the drive to San Francisco, driving back to Sacramento, waking up, going to work and doing all that stuff or teaching the next day. I was teaching at one point when I was doing some of that stuff. Um, but I, I find myself definitely falling asleep at like 10 o'clock. You can ask my wife, we'll be watching a movie. And I, I, I think we were watching Rent. I, I don't remember how it ended. Especially I woke up. You as a DJ, you have to close the club. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. A lot of people, they get hyped. They're like, yeah, I'm the closer. I'm like, nowadays, I'm like, I'm happy with being the opener because then I can leave early. <laughs> but, but as the, um, as I reflect in, in terms of what's happening, like in the future, like I am planning to return working with Kathy Reyes doing Bachata Nights and Rico Fridays uh, whenever Ashkenaz reopens. Uh, in addition, just kind of doing local gigs here and there in the Sacramento area. But I would say outside of working with Kathy, I would not expect anything regular from me. From me. Yeah. Um, I, and I think that's largely in part because I, I just want to be more intentional with my time. Um, yeah. And, and just being more cognizant of my mental health. Like I was, as, as one of my close friends in education would say, and he knew, he knew, he was watching me. I was burning the candle on both ends. You know, I was uh, trying to be a superstar at work and being a superstar in the, in the dance promoting scene and things like, or trying to be, I, I would say more than anything. And um, I, I was exhausted, man. I was yeah. exhausted. When I finally had that break and that, lent, that time to step back and look at everything, I'm like, I, I, I paid my dues. I paid my dues, man. <laughs> two people that I miss in the Bay or in our community when it comes to that. But like you said, you used to do it all the time, but when you're gone, you're gone, meaning where the hell did he go? <laughs> you know, people would wonder, but there are two people that I miss in the industry. You, number one, number two, Corey. These are the two people that, you know, whenever you do a party, definitely you'll have fun, not to mention they bring their friends. Uh, uh, that's, and, and I have not seen, and I say this as a compliment, I don't say this to put down others, but I have not seen any other personality uh, in our industry, meaning local, that have done that, that was able to do that. You know, of course, I separate Salsa Crazy there, because Salsa Crazy, I, you know, we're on the old level. <laughs> But, but at least you guys, we have you guys, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it's uh, on the topic of Salsa Crazy. So uh, I know for folks, I have received a couple messages here and there uh, with relation to Hapachata Nights. Uh, Hapachata Nights was, you know, one of the more popular bachata socials um, in the Bay for, for a period of time. And, of time. you know, and it stopped for whatever reason. I picked it back up, kind of revamped it 
reinvigorated the, the, the attendance for it and whatnot as, as it was, again, building up from the ground up. Yep. Uh, I'm no longer doing that event. So for the folks who continue to ask, I'm, I'm no longer affiliated or working uh, with the Hop and Chop the Nights event. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> you know, Sunday nights are really tough when you got to work Monday morning. Um, but, you know, I, I know whoever it is that potentially takes it over in the future or whatever other event, you know, emerges as a result of that. I know uh, Sunday nights, uh, an essence dance company has their um, social that happens like every other week or so. And, and, you know, there are events out there. There are events out there than which you can attend. And if you're curious and want to potentially start your own event, look into it. Just know it's a lot of work, even if it is for one day. Um, you know, I, I learned my lesson early on, you know, Hop and Chop the Night started off as a weekly event. Weeklies are a killer. We switched to monthly and then the club was undergoing some renovations. We switched to quarterly and back and forth to monthly. It, it's, it was, you know, when you're at the will of the club and people were just like, you should switch venues, you should do this. And I was just going to say that, that venue is a pain in the ass, man. <laughs> It was rough. You're it was not rough. able to say that, but I can say that. That just the location and the club owners. Jeez, Lord, man. <laughs> I, for them, you know, I, I love them to death, man. They're such like who they are and, and the work that they do professionally with their bartender security. The yeah. owners as well. I've had a great working relationship with them and the general yeah. managers and everyone have been, you know, absolutely stellar. But they saw it as well on me in which you know, I, I was living again, the Batman life, you know, I was out here playing music or, you know, DJing, managing coat check and handling the entrance and all these other things. And you, you just, you get tired, man, you yeah. get tired. So having a team to help you out and create those things. I mean, if you're, if you're looking to start something, definitely be sure you have a team, people that you can trust. Um, because at a certain point, you know, once you cross a certain threshold, as far as like income coming in, like you have to really, really be intentional about like, absolutely. Who, who's helping you manage yeah. all that stuff. And then, uh, yeah, it got, it got interesting when tax season came up. <laughs> it is interesting, isn't it? Uh, th th those are one of the, one of these days, I'm going to have to do a podcast about the business because not, not too many people about doing taxes and, and other stuff, <laughs> especially oh when gosh. they're full time, when, when they don't have a insurance or retirement for crying out loud. That's another thing that our industry, at least half of them, they're not thinking of that because when you're what, when you're your early twenties, you're not going to think of those things. No. I mean, we, I remember when I was in my early twenties, you're probably in your late twenties. Are you in your thirties or late? I'm in my thirties now. Yeah. No, yeah. So, so now you're feeling it. Mm. You're feeling it, you know, but then we don't feel those damn things. It didn't matter. Mm. We would go next day to work just like no other and drink. I mean, but, yeah, these are the things that I probably need to do a podcast on that. But anyways, so does this mean uh, you're not going to be able to join us at the 14-year anniversary of San Francisco Bachata Festival? Because my wife asked. Is this, a form is this the formal invitation? <laughs> this is a formal invitation, sir. <laughs> you, you know, it's, you know I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fully transparent with, it, with everybody uh, who's, who's tuning in and listening. Um, I think one of the big things that I'm just more conscious of is just like, Again, what's currently happening? Yes. And and uh, I interact with a lot of different people in, in in my life, close, very close to me, family, friends, in which I have to be very mindful of you know places I go and yep. people I interact with and stuff. So is that to say the? I mean the the beauty about with San Francisco, it's it's in the middle of summer. Yes. So it's not. Uh, something that in which I have to think about too much in which I'm like, okay, if I go to this, I have yeah. to like do X, Y, and Z to make sure that I'm good to go to interact with someone, uh, such and such person. Yeah. And um, I'll tentatively say yes for the, for the camera. <laughs> yeah, yes. I know I, it's local. So that yeah. means you could, you could come in one night or so because Ex exactly. I know how colleges, I know how community colleges, you, yeah. you have certain breaks and you don't have certain breaks. Yeah. Uh, you certain holidays that you get to have, you know, this type of thing. Um, yeah. So uh, it, you, you know my events, man. So you know I when do. you're available, you let me know because definitely, of course, Isidra would look for you in, in, in that regard. Thank you. Uh, right now, uh, because she's so busy at work, uh, she does hire certain talents that she knows. Yeah. And she leaves up to me other things that, 
that she doesn't know that she can't handle and and this is for this this is why she asked me to ask you about those things and of course we got hawaii during april 23 27 i don't know if that's a spring break for you <laughs> so uh, uh, uh las vegas definitely yeah, yeah. you're going to be able to because that's on september you're busy during that yeah. time but you know yeah, my yeah. event yeah yeah you know, no of course you know we'll love to have you, you yeah I, I appreciate it and and for those folks who are like well you know it's so far away you can give a tentative yes and and also there there is another important person i have to talk to and for folks if you if you're not married if you're not married you you don't <laughs> You're not familiar. And I'm, I'm really intentional nowadays, especially about having those conversations with my wife. Like I, I check in with her and, yep. you know, we kind of gauge and see, and it's more so checking in to see where I'm at. And, and typically like, you know, a lot of times we're good to go. I can, you know, do an event and, and go out and have that fun. But, you know, as Rodney said, and I actually, I live in Sacramento now. So I don't, I don't do think, you? I yeah. I in the Bay, dude. I do was. You, do you work in the area also? No, no, I commute. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, yeah oh yeah see so for folks who are tuning in who don't understand like california geography uh sacramento which is actually the capital of uh california it's not san francisco a lot of people think that um i depending on the day my commute sometimes takes anywhere between like two and a half to three hours um just just to get to work in some cases but i'll typically leave a day before stay with friends or family and then you know do work for a few days and come back up but um yeah a commute commuter's life and then my other because i work at two colleges i work remotely for the other one so yeah remote work you know it's been but, a lifesaver but, no that's a blessing man i'm yeah. glad you're using what you learn uh in the universities and and whatnot and you're you're that's your stable job and now your passion is will always be there and 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 you know i don't know come time to time you would do that and yeah and that's a good thing i i don't think that would ever be away from us when it comes to passion. I mean, yeah. look at me, I'm 55 years old now. I think I started my dance career in my late 30s or early 30s maybe, because, you know, I used to do that. And now I can't even, a whole, I can't even dance a whole salsa song, dude. I probably have a heart attack, although I need to do my cardio more. <laughs> but anyways, uh, dude, it's good to talk to you. It's good to, to touch base. With likewise, you, man. Because, likewise. you know, uh, you know, you got contributions in the Bay Area that you made there. And it's not just being a DJ, but it's about changing lives. And yeah. you know, that's that that's why people follow you. And when people follow you, you do change lives, uh, whether directly or indirectly. That's just the way it is. And uh, with this two years, we lost some friends of ours in the industry. Uh, uh, and uh, we will never forget what they've done for us as a community. But one of the things that we need to do as a community in the Bay is that not only we should appreciate and remember the things that people have done for us, those people that are contributing uh, when they're dead, but when they're still alive, which is probably the most important thing because when they're dead, it's, it's, it's a little bit too late. So as uh, my audience here, uh, don't forget that there are still people living here that are contributing to our community. Let's appreciate them and let's express that to them. Yeah, I definitely to echo with what you're saying, Rodney, I, I think a lot of times that gets missed. And, you know, folks, as, as you reflect on your own life, you know that you have, you may have a lot of things going on. And you can probably look at that person, that DJ, promoter, dance instructor, probably get a sense of where they are with their life too. And a lot of times we, you don't see what's happening behind the scenes. You don't know what's happening in their personal life. You'll get the show, you'll get the, the happy-go-lucky personality, right. the, the party goer, the person who's creating the vibe and the environment. Um, but just be, be mindful, be kind. You know, you, there's a way in which you can communicate that you're uh, unsatisfied with the event that you attended, yeah. but just be, be mindful, man. Like there are, be mindful as people are in different spaces and just let them know if you did appreciate the event that they did, send them a direct message. Yep. Uh, if you love the music that your DJ played for the night or if they played your song, yep. that's, that's huge. That, and let that DJ know, hey, you made my night. Thank you so much for playing my song. I really appreciate it. 
your promoter, hey, thanks so much for hosting this event. I really needed this outlet. Your dance instructor, thanks for teaching me that new move. You know, like I'm, I'm really, really just thankful to add it to my repertoire. Um, let them know. It's, it's so important. I think nowadays, especially like it's so important to just be considerate and kind. And, and I know like sometimes for some people, that's a new thing. It's very uncomfortable or it's, it's an aspect in which we we're, we're learning, but also just being, being mindful of just like that, that small act of kindness can go a long way. You never know. You might make that person's day for, for that compliment that you gave them, or you may have been the only compliment that they received. Yeah. And I make it a point to be intentional of connecting and communicating with, with events that I go to and letting them know, Hey man, thank you so much. Like I'm appreciate the, the drink. I appreciate the, the dance or, or just the opportunity to attend your event and just thanking them and just being intentional about it. Cause again, it goes a long way. What what was your last question here? What was your memorable moments at Congresses? Ooh, memorable moments at Congresses. Um, you know, there's so many. I a know you got, you got invited to so many. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A few uh, moments. I mean, I do for crying out loud. You know <laughs> I think um, I'll start with probably one of the ones that really stands out to me um, right now uh, was, and I don't, I don't want to say it's a Congress, it's a Weekender. Mm-hmm. Um, Singapore, when I performed in Singapore, um, that was a really special opportunity because I, and I don't think I've ever told people this. Is that the Singapore Latin dance? Uh, Singapore Bachata Weekender. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was hosted by Christina Pan, I believe it was. And, uh, and I forget her, Max, I forget, I think, believe it was his name, but uh, Christina invited me. She came out, she was actually visiting, she was training with Alma Latina yeah. and made her way up to the, up California and she attended Kathy's event, heard me play at Bachata Nights, invited me, didn't think I'd go. <laughs> and I hit, I texted her. I was like, Hey, I bought a flight to Singapore during the Bachata weekend. Um, you think I could come through and play? And she was so excited and, and just, you know, so thankful for her and her team yep. and just accommodating myself, my wife, uh, my friend who was traveling with us at the time. Um, and that Congress or that weekender was really special to me because I played for an audience in which I was completely unfamiliar with. Right. Uh, and there were, in some cases, language barriers and things like that and yeah. trying to communicate. But, you know, a lot of people spoke English and stuff, but not a lot of people spoke Spanish. So it was mainly the instructors that, that spoke Spanish and, and really just trying to communicate that in, in the essence of what Machata was to the people. Um, but that was a fun event. I loved it because I took it upon myself to challenge myself that weekend. I, I decided to go in and play like a variety of music of Machata and, and not play the same thing for the next day. Yeah. It was very intentional. I studied, listened to other DJs, studied the crowd and, and really, mind you, 16 hours different time difference that jet lag you, you're up there you, you're just trying to stay awake and be present <laughs> but you tough. know it's it's worth it because to get invited and one of the things that i appreciated when i did tour world tour in my younger days is it's not just being invited that that you appreciate it's the new friends it's even though you haven't met them before, it's still yeah. almost like a family. They, yeah. they treat you, they welcome you well, you know? Yeah, and, and I appreciate that hos- hospitality that I've received over the years. I mean, recently, um, having had performed and played in the Philippines, I love it, man. Like, you know, Filipinos. I'm sure they thought your wife is Filipino or you. They did, they did. <laughs> well, they definitely thought she was. They would come up and speak Tagalog to her and she'd be like, sorry. I told you, man. <laughs> Um, but beyond the weekender, I mean, the weekender was a special one. I mean, a lot of the international events that I've done, uh, definitely were very special, but memories, I think that stands out, I think was, um, probably the first, my, well, my first time DJing a Congress. And I believe it was for you, Rod, uh, when, for school, Reno? I think it might've been SF. Yeah. Playing, yeah. You know, doing my little hometown hero kind of thing, and <laughs> going up there and, and doing my thing and, and the the piece that was stood out to me was overcoming that self-doubt yeah and that worth that i did not feel that i had to perform at at that congress because i remember playing with djs that i admired and respected like invincible um uh 
Uh, Vince is the one that stands out right now, but you know, good Vince show. Will, Vince uh, will always stand out at my congressman, not to mention he's he MCs, you know. Yeah, Chino and, and countless uh, Super Chino and, and yeah. countless others, folks that I had developed relationships with and watched them master their craft and present and showcase themselves in such a way that that they knew their audience and they knew what they brought to the table. And it was through that experience of just like, I am deserving to be here. Yeah, I am. I was clearly invited. <laughs> I, I do have something, some value that I'm, I'm presenting to this, to this audience. And yeah. I want to be able to highlight and showcase that. Um, and I think that was probably one of the more memorable experiences was taking that stage for the first time and I, I don't know what it is. In some cases, some congresses, there's not really a, a, there's just not too much of a transition that happens. Just the next DJ jumps on and yeah. no one really knows that anything but changed. You don't, you don't always forget your first time, especially when yeah. you're in a good environment. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I think the coolest thing for me was uh, Vince introduced me. And That's good. And it was one of those humbling experiences when Vince, you know, you know make some noise, San Francisco Bay Area for your, uh, one of your hometown DJs, DJ Miggs. And at the time, to hear the audience receive me, hear my name, and for me to play that first track, because it's a lot. It's a lot to think about. What? What's? Yeah, how are you gonna? How are you gonna start things? I remember that you had, ladies and gentlemen, we give discount codes to everyone, not just because to sell tickets, to track how many people you sell tickets, and so not only my crowd were cheering for you your crowd that you brought were cheering for you man <laughs> yeah 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 and and for me is like i brought with me a college two colleges a few yes. colleges yes. yeah so to have that audience follow me attend that event cheer me on and to play and bring our style of of what we were dancing to and and the music that we were listening to to the congress which again it's not different from what everyone else was listening to but it was specifically we had that crowd with us yeah that really really got to share with the community like again a bunch of college kids that you're just experiencing it for the first time and yeah. you're you're now like wide-eyed and 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 wanting to just like dance with as many people as you can and really really contribute to that like positive uh interactions that people were just having at congresses at the time that's one of the things i always appreciate about your congresses around these like there's this focus on the social dancing and specifically that yeah. everyone danced with everybody That's i've true. i've been to so many events you know globally and you can see it that there's like there's the clicks that happen and yeah. and there's this idea of just like oh you're uh you're not at my level you're a beginner and i always hated that because at one point people forget like we were all beginners at one point man yeah. and and it's and it's intimidating to go up and ask somebody to dance shoot i'm I, I don't know if I, I'm intermediate, I guess people are like, oh, you're a pro. I'm like, I, I, I'm an intermediate. Like, I, I, I stick to my basic, you know, I stick to my basic. And, um, uh, you know, you, you know, the rules in the Bay Area. Yeah. If and you get paid for what you do. You're a pro. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a reason we get paid for what you do because you're a pro. You're good. You know, yeah, yeah. You're consistent at it. That's, that's another thing, you know, uh, been consistent at it. But do I appreciate it. Um, it's, it's been a great ride for you and the young ones. I don't consider you young now, but I would still call you young because everybody's young before me, <laughs> after me, <laughs> or before me, actually. Everybody's young. I'm the one that's old now. I will always call you kids, you know, but uh, uh, I appreciate are, it. Who are the upcoming talents that I should look up to? Or look um. To? Talents as far as instructors, promoters, DJs, uh, DJs, uh, DJs and, and, and instructors, DJs and instructors, you know, your uh, crowd, you know, your, your community, uh, you're still in touch with your old friends, I believe. Yes. Yeah, I, I definitely am. And, and I, I think it's one of those pieces in which I, I look at it and, and I guess what qualifies and counts as you know, uh, new and upcoming, because a lot of these folks have been in the scene and dancing, but I guess now as uh, some of the uh, OGs, if you will, or some of the <laughs> folks who've been, who've been at it stepped away, it's, you know, it's their time to shine and, and make noise from themselves. Um, instructors, as far as what I've seen and just me appreciating their work, uh, definitely, I would say, um, uh, Edwin and Kat, they are 
uh, a, a couple that have been instructing and teaching within the Bay Area um, and coming out to the Sacramento area pretty regularly. Uh, definitely are been appreciated. Are they from the Bay or are from the SAC? I believe they're, I mean, they themselves, they live in the Bay, North right. Bay at that. I think they're up in Santa Rosa area, but they, you know, again, they're, they're paying their dues. They're making yeah. that drive to SAC. They're yeah. going down South Bay and all that. Um, DJs, of course you have my, my close friends, you know, of, of the DJ community, of course you have DJ. And again, these guys are not, when I say this, don't take it the wrong way for those folks who are wondering, going to message them directly. Mig said you're, you're a, you're new blood. I'm like, you're, you're new DJs. I'm like, no, these guys have been working and they've been really, really grinding to, yeah. to continue keeping the dance alive. Um, you have, of course, DJ Ron, very close friend of mine, DJ Relio, crisscross um his name escapes me right now there's there's a dj a, gen a gentleman who approached me one evening and um i feel really bad i'll, I'll have to, to ping you in it or i'll look on the other monitor as i find it <laughs> but but i do want to highlight one person in particular um on of course of course i mean she's been in the scene for a number of years uh kathy reyes she's coming back with her events and everything um knock when and and uh or knock Knockout Dance, I believe, is the, the dance company. Knock is the director, and, and Juan Solis. They're you know they're growing and emerging their dance community. But I do want to highlight this individual here on this podcast, um, and that is uh, Larry Tony. Uh, Larry, for those folks who don't know, um, he has been an integral part of re-starting uh, Sacramento Dance. He was the one who had brought Grupo Extra, um, recently Extreme DJ Soul Tricks. He's uh, Cole, uh, creating his own Congress out here in the Sacramento area, the first one of its, uh, to my knowledge, yeah. and just really, really growing and developing that and creating a place for people to dance. I love Larry because his vision and what he does is specifically for the dance community. You know, he wants people to have a place to call their own and to, to just have fun. That's probably the biggest thing. A lot of people, like they get into the dance scene and they look at it and it's like, it's a market, you know, I'm, I'm going to, profit and you know cut these people and cut that person and you know th that stuff comes back and people remember people remember yeah. like i've i've been in the scene for for 12 years as a dancer i've been working at it for almost 10 years now i've been burned i've been cut you know um in in so many different ways rod you're shaking your head i, I you know exactly what i'm talking about i'm sure people yeah. at home are listening and and you know one of those pieces and what i always appreciate about larry he was just very real and, and again, his mission has never changed. It was, it was just to have a place to dance and to see him do his thing and to, to create a space for us, uh, for the dance community um, has been something really, really beautiful to see because I, I attended one, I think his one year social uh, anniversary and I walked in and you know, you're, as, as, as folks who've been in the scene, you walk into somewhere, you know you're gonna run into some old, the, the faces that you're used to. When I walked into Larry's event, I saw maybe six people that I knew yeah, and the rest were fresh faces. And I, I thought that was the coolest thing because I was like, this is what the community needs yep. is to, you, you need new blood. You need new dancers to come in there and, and reinvigorate and reinvent, you know, what, what is being created. Well, not reinvent, but essentially create what they're doing for themselves. And yeah. it's a really beautiful thing to see and, and to, to witness. But Larry, uh, I can't stress him enough, man. He's, he's, he's a phenomenal guy. He's, he's real. He's about it. He, 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 one of the guys who followed me from Sacramento all the way to the Bay, he would text me and be like, Hey Migs, I'm coming to hop and chop the nights. I got a car. I got two cars full of people. And I said, Oh, cool, man. Like awesome. And people would just come and have those experiences. So uh, he'd definitely be one, one of the main ones. And then instructors, of course, you know, um, take a look. See, see who's out there. There's a lot of amazing instructors who are out there. Young ones now coming up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. A lot of folks uh, that are, are, are emerging. So. Yeah. There's one uh, young girl or young lady in Sacramento. Uh, I forgot her name, but she used to partner up with sometimes Andrew, sometimes. Uh, what's that guy named? That director you're talking about? Uh, he used to do photography. Oh, knock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, knock. Yeah, 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 yeah. She used to partner I, I, with him too. Uh, I don't think she lives in Sacramento now. No, she she lives in the, uh, she lives in the Bay. I think oh, she's out in the yeah. San Leandro area. Yeah. Um, 
it's interesting. I'm I'm trying to find the the DJ. Was that here. Leslie? What's her name? I think she is half white, half black. Uh, not too sure. Lexi? Yeah, she lives in Sacramento, man. I don't know if she lives in Sacramento now because of college or whatever, or maybe she's yeah, yeah. right now. I don't know. But yeah. I did find the other DJ who's on, who's doing his, paying his dues, emerging DJ Nando, uh, FHL. I'm not too sure what that stands for, but DJ Nando, he's, he's growing and developing himself out here in the Sacramento area. And, okay. you know, he's, he's, he's paying his dues. He, he's, he's been someone who I watched grow as a dancer, just really falling in love with the community. And he took his shot and became a DJ and he's, he's developed his own following and stuff. So it's really, really great to see like, you know, folks, it's great to drive out and attend places like San Francisco and the major yeah. cities, but also take a look at what's happening in your hometown. Uh, if you're in a certain city and just look who's around you, because you know, some folks are struggling to kind of get their start and they need that support. So being mindful and intentional of that, of, of supporting them, because we all need that support to continue these yeah. events from going on. Cause Lord knows like there's only a certain point in which, you know, your personal bank account becomes that, that front for that club to pay that bar tab. <laughs> it is true. Oh, by the way, that person right there is Lexi. Yes. yes. Lexi Shriv. Is that, is that what we were talking about? But that's, yeah, Lexi has a lot of potential. Uh, I hope you're listening, Lexi. Keep it up. Hone your skills and, and don't give up if actually that's your goal. All right. Yeah. If that's yeah. not your goal, well, don't do it because <laughs> you wouldn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in, it's a, it's a grind. It's a journey, folks. You know, know that I and a lot of people don't know this. And I will say this here. And Rodney, if you ever bring them, bring them on the podcast, be sure to be sure to bring this up. Uh, Samantha Arias, oh. director of Vanessa's Dance Company. Folks, I have known Samantha <laughs> for 12 years. Uh. Samantha and I started dancing around the same time. And, you know, our, our trajectory, of course, he's, he's an instructor, co-director of an essence dance company with Brian, uh, Brian Shroud. They have the lar- uh, they have one of the largest members right now, uh, dance team. Yes. Yeah, they, they do. They do. And, and we all started somewhere. So I remember I got, I got performance, old school performance videos. Our first performance, major performance was at San Francisco International Bachata Festival. Yeah. Um, we all took our first classes. Our first class was with Corey and Miriel and our first tech rehearsal. And, and uh, I'll never forget it, because of course, you, you always remember that first yeah. tech. Um, we were in tech rehearsal with Island Touch at the time, Ataka, La Alemana, uh, I think Figueroa was with them, and I forget, they had, they had another individual who was <laughs> working with them, yeah. and they cheered us on, you know, during that tech rehearsal, and that was our first, like, major performance, and, you know, we did our thing, we performed, of course, Samantha and I were part of a dance team at the time, and, and um, but yeah, we, we've come a long way we've grown and, and it's just as those folks who are just getting started now they're growing they're adapting they're they're learning uh as much as they can and, and are hopefully presenting and bringing to you an incredible amazing event and experience for you to, yeah, to they, they're away. always at my they're always at san francisco bachata festival uh like I, I i had a conversation with them one time where i was teary a little bit because i think they went to reno we didn't know they went to reno and then my wife was partying at certain hotels like Come here, uh, Samantha, Sam, and Sam and uh, Brian are here. So I met them, and and I didn't, you know, I'm a type of guy who can't say a lot of things, not able to say a lot of things, but I was able to say how much I appreciate them because coming from the Bay Area and traveling all over the world for bachata, um, none was able to duplicate that for me. But then <laughs> Brian, Samantha, I, I was like guys, i so proud of you. You're able to, to, to follow what I did and then some and more because there are a couple, not to mention building one of the largest dance team in the Bay Area. And then they get to travel the world, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it, it's... But anyway, brother, uh, thank much. Let us know if you're good for SFIBF or other events. Uh, I know Hello. you have your family thing and that's what I've been learning during this pandemic also. Uh, wifey and I get to spend time with our family, do the holidays together. There's so much great appreciating your own family, especially when you get to spend time with your little nephews and nie- nieces. And yeah. I, I used to be not good with kids, but I was able to open up there and, 
and and yeah, that's a good thing. And uh, keep that up because that's the most important thing. Thank you, family. man. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's family. Like passion stuff, right? Exactly, man. And and I would say, and and for folks who are like, as we're you know getting ready to sign off and everything. You know, these friendships that you're developing, I can honestly look at the dance scene and I have developed lifelong friends yep. uh, from all over the world. You know, some of my closest friends live there internationally, DJ York, DJ yep. Manuel Chitro, um, the countless folks I've met in all these other countries, John Robert in Chile, Enriquez over in the Philippines. And I, I can go on, the list can go on, the <laughs> list can go on. And I'm sure, you know, it's, it's great to have that reflection, but, um, you know, just, just the folks that you're meeting here, um, take the time, check in with them, yep. especially now during this time, if you haven't been dancing, I know for a lot of folks, it's been a really, really tough time in which you haven't been able to connect with your friends and go out and do the typical social dancing things, but connect with your friends, check in with them, see how they're doing, yep. um, check in with your family as well. This is a really, really um, a challenging time. As, as Rodney has shared earlier on in this video, our, our scene has seen a, a number of people unfortunately pass away as, as a result of you know, the pandemic and, and other life complications and stuff, but, you know, it's be intentional, just reach out and, yeah. and know that these, uh, these opportunities are very precious and, um, you know, dance will always be there, but those friendships that you're developing as, as we're learning, it's very fragile and, and they may not always be. So very much. So anyways, brother, uh, I'll post this on social media and all of that, but thank you for spending time with me. Uh, I will see you around when it comes to Congress. We'll reconnect, okay? Yeah, yeah, most definitely, Rod. Thank you again for the opportunity. Good night or afternoon, everyone. It's, it's daytime. Afternoon. I don't step outside, afternoon. so. <laughs> Bye for now. Have a good one.